see that uh, ion beam milling can be turned in an additive technique as well. But ultrasonic machining cannot. So we're going to start with ultrasonic machining. What is that all about? It's actually a quite simple technique. Look at these two pictures here, and they kind of give you the idea of what's going on. Suppose you have a tool over here, a structure. Actually, it's this thing here. Uh, this is the machine. This machine makes a tool, this part, vibrate very fast, actually, at ultrasonic frequencies. So it makes this uh, tool do like this, chuk, 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 goes up and down at a frequency of, let's say, 20,000 hertz, which is in the audible range. So from there, ultrasonic machine. What happens when you do that? Well, you have this shape here of this tool, let's say it's a cylinder. And at the same time, while you're doing like this with this tool, you're feeding it a slurry of powder, a very hot powder. And that powder, when that tool is going up and down, it hits the material. And the powder chips away on your workpiece. So in other words, you end up with the negative of the shape of this part. If this is a cylinder, what you will be machining in your substrate is a rectangle. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> it's a, a cylindrical hole, obviously, right? Who said that about the rectangle? <laughs> That's actually a good joke. <laughs> so in ultrasonic machining, also called ultrasonic grinding, high frequency vibrations delivered to a tooltip. Uh, so here is the tooltip. That is the negative of the structure you want to make. So that tooltip is embedded in an abrasive slurry. And here, so you have the abrasive slurry feeding into uh, the workpiece area. Right? And uh, the vibration are created by a booster or sonotrode, which is this device here. By the way, does anyone know how you go from mechanical vibration to electrical energy and vice versa? What is that phenomenon called? Yeah, very good. Like quartz, for example. If you push on quartz, uh, what you will see is a voltage being generated. And vice versa, if you apply an AC voltage to quartz, the quartz expands, contracts, expands, contracts. And so in other words, this is what this thing does, this sonal throat. There's a piezoelectric in there. And that piezoelectric is fed this AC signal, and it causes this tool to make this movement. Yeah? So we create uh, accurate cavities of virtually any shape, and they are the negatives of the tool. Yeah? So for example, if you have a cylinder, you end up with, where is the rectangle, man? <laughs> So since this, okay, this is important now, because we're going to start figuring out what machining tool do I use for what. So in what case are you going to use ultrasonic machining? Well, think about it. This has no thermal energy. And you'll see that any machining technique that uses thermal energy causes some damage. There's a heat-affected zone we will talk about, HAZ, heat-affected zone. That's almost always there if you use a machining technique that's thermal. And suppose you cannot afford that, or you have a very brittle material, a ceramic. That's when you're going to use ultrasonic machining. So since this method is non-thermal, non-electrical, and non-chemical, uh, it produces virtually stress-free shapes, even in hard and brittle workpieces. So ultrasonic drilling is most effective for hard and brittle materials, so a soft material like a rubber won't do very much. Eh? Because you can kind of imagine if that hard structure hits the rubber, what might happen? Yeah, it's being pushed back. In a way, the harder the material, actually the faster you will be abrading it, the faster you will machine in it. So soft materials absorb too much sound energy and make the process less efficient. Uh, this is a blow up of this part here. That's not too difficult, right? Ultrasonic machining. That's the ma yes. What did you call that? Uh, the, the metal that expands and contracts and by the uh, Which one? Uh, the the uh, part that's vibrating. The sonotrode. Sonotrode. 
Sonotrip? Yeah, the word is so much. Yeah, there. Yeah. Five booster of Sonotrip. Right. Very good. And here is a hole <laughs> made with ultrasonic drilling. So almost any hard and brittle material, including aluminum oxide, silicon, silicon carbide, silicon nitride, glass, quartz, sapphire, you know, all of these can be cut ultrasonically. The tool does not exert any pressure. That's correct, right? That tool doesn't sit directly on that surface. It's the movement of the tool above the surface that hits the particles in the slurry. And these particles then do all of the work. So the tool does not exert any pressure on the workpiece. You could call it drilling without drills. And it's often made from a softer material than the workpiece, say from brass, cold rolled steel, or stainless steel, and wears only slightly. You know what? You are asking about homeworks. Uh, why don't we do this? I'm going to accumulate questions that I myself are kind of not really completely sure how this can be true. So, is that easy? <laughs> can I ask that question? It's the lady behind the big computer screen. <laughs> is this a fair deal? <laughs> Okay, so, you know, when I read this, to me, somehow there's something wrong with it. And if there's these hard particles, right, why don't these particles also consume the tool more? So if you could give us a good answer for that. So, assignment, write it down. Actually, you guys have other assignments. I remember two other assignments. Let's do that. All of these assignments, that, and these are often things that I don't know myself, you know, <laughs> but I have an inkling. So what were the other assignments? So write them down. You're making your homework as we go here. Number one was, that helps me figuring out who has been in all the classes. The third yeah, there were three economy. ways to making a strong economy. Mining, manufacturing, and something else. Some people think it should also start with an M, but I'm not convinced about that. So. What was the second one? There was another one. Hole in the air. Sir? Hole in the air. How did you make the hole in there? That's right. But that <laughs> will be in a later class. So it's, that's too easy. Huh? Uh, so your second one will be this. That second bullet point. You know, why would the tool itself not wear out as fast as what your machine? And I don't care if you Google it, but you give me a nice answer to that. So would someone be so nice to write these questions down and email them to me? Can I assign some? Who's a good writer? Oh, it's there, an no one. It's what? an engineering class. Edward, you Andrew. volunteer. Oh, uh, Andrew, OK, then it's not you. <laughs> Andrew, will you do that? Which one? Both. Both? Yeah. No, no, you don't have to answer it. You just have to type it in so I can distribute it to the whole class. Oh, sure, yes. Yeah, Great. So you will get these questions also more formally because I know some of your friends are not here and others will not have understood the question. I will massage it such that it becomes a good question. And it serves a purpose because, aren't you curious about that? I am. <laughs> I'm happy you don't all say no. <laughs> So at least you're a little bit curious. Uh, the third bullet point uh, is something I alluded to. Where does this ultrasonic technology come from? Well, it can go all the way back to work by Pierre Curie, uh, who in 1880 did indeed invent, or discover, I should not say invent, the piezoelectric effect. He found that asymmetric crystals, such as quartz and this Rochelle, uh, Rochelle salt, generates electric charge when mechanical pressure is applied. And conversely, mechanical vibration are obtained by applying electrical oscillation to the same crystals. And why ultrasonic? Well, they have waves uh, or sound waves of frequencies higher than 20,000 hertz. A little bit more information about ultrasonic machining. Uh, here you see a polycrystalline silicon wafer. And it has been ultrasonically machined in one step to create these bluff bodies. So in a way, what you see here is that you can batch produce. Huh? If your tool is big enough, you can divide it in repeating units. That means each of these uh, mesas, so to speak, are made all at the same time. So that's a typical 
ultrasonically machined structure, in this case polycrystalline silicon. Uh, this is getting a bit more detail yet. Yes? This is kind of like milling with a mold. No. You can like make a molded shape. You see, oh, you, you could make, make a mold. shape on the end of a tool bit and then vibrate that shape onto Absol each of the wafers individually. Absolutely, and that's being done. Absolutely. So you're getting the feel of what you can do with manufacturing. Very good. So this tool, no, not, not that tool, but you could make it a tool, as you suggest. Eh? Typically vibrating at a low amplitude of about 0.025 millimeter. Uh, by the way, uh, so that means the distance that that tool travels is small. Eh? It's 0.025 millimeter. And at the frequency, we said already 2200 kilohertz. And so it gradually feeds into the workpiece. And the water that brings the slurry also flushes out the material that you're abrading. Yes? So is the tool that's taking that piece exactly? Yeah, it must be the negative of that. Eh? Yeah. That, no, it's very good. That, that was the point I was making. Eh? It makes it all in one go. All right. uh, so, second bullet point, the vibration transmits a high velocity force to this fine abrasive slurry, eh? uh, to these grains, between the tool and the surface of the workpiece. In the process, material is removed by microchipping or erosion with the abrasive particles. The grains are in a water slurry, which also serves to remove debris from the cutting area. And the high frequency power supply, uh, by the way, so you do not need to necessarily work with piezoelectric, you can also work with magnetostrictive. Now what is magnetostrictive? Yeah, it's the, it's the piezoelectricity effect, but with magnets instead. So magnetic material. You can apply a magnetic field and it will expand or contract and vice versa. Eh? So magneti magneto uh, effects or piezoelectric effects. And so uh, the power rating is something like 0.1 to 40 kilowatt. And a little bit later I will show you a typical such machine, ultrasonic machine. Uh, some examples of these particles, these abrasive particles one uses. So they can be silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, boron carbide. Uh, with a diameter of anywhere between 8 to 500 microns uh, and they are suspended in water or sometimes oil. And the particle size and the vibration amplitude are usually made about the same. In other words, if you work with 500 micron particle, you will make that vibration amplitude about the same uh, amount. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, you can easily understand point 0.3, right? If you have big particles, you will do a rougher cut than if you have very small particles. Mm -hmm. So the particle size determines the roughness or surface finish and the speed of the cut. Uh, this is important here. When we start comparing different machining options, we already know some benefits, right, of this. No thermal damage, right? Uh, no, it, it doesn't need to be conductive. For example, if you do electrical machining, you need a conductive substrate. In this case, it doesn't matter, right? It can be an insulator. These are all good points, but this is a bad one. The removal rate is typically slow, eh? something like 50 millimeter cube per minute. These are other examples of some seals of universities cut out with ultrasonic machinery. Uh, this slide uh, here, you can forget, you can put across, you don't need to know uh, these details. It correlates the uh, machining speed with the ratio of hardness over elasticity modulus. In previous years, I gave this as a question to graduate students to try to figure out why that is so, why there's a relation between machining speed and roughness and this H over E uh, ratio. But uh, I'm going to absolve you guys from that. Uh, you're going to get enough work in this course, so let's forget about that. Huh? Uh, if we don't need to find it out ourselves, can you tell us? Yes, uh, actually it's there. <laughs> so higher H to E ratios also lead to higher removal rates. It is basically, if H is higher, high hardness, E is also uh, typically somewhat higher, but not proportionally. So if both uh, go up, you will cut off bigger chunks and you will machine faster. But that's only an intuitive explanation. 
Uh, if you then go into the uh, continuum me mechanics and the details of it, it's quite a bit more complex, and you will actually find in the literature people that are debating the real answer. And that's why I want to exclude it for now. Okay? So I think the next is a typical machine, uh, like the sonic mill, the sonic milling machine. So they cost uh, up to $20,000, which is not all that expensive, and production rates of about, let's say, 2,500 parts per machine per day are typical. If the machine part is a complex element, uh, for example, a fluidic element in glass or in quartz, this is a pretty good approach. Uh, and if the best material to be used is an inert, hard ceramic, how else will you machine it? All right? Especially if it's an insulator. So it's a pretty good uh, solution for that. And here is a comparison table, and, and this is now an important slide. For almost any machining technique we encounter, we will have pros and cons. And so if I then ask a question, look, I'm going to cut this rubber piece with ultrasonic machining, you immediately can say, no, you're not going to do it, <laughs> right? It's not a good option. Uh, but it's by looking at these tables that you get the feel for what machining this technique to use where. So advantages. Uh, Let's have someone read this out here. Someone with a loud voice. Who has a very loud voice? Tenor, tenor voice. Okay. Me? Yeah. Uh, advantages. Advantages. Machining a penny, you want me to say Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Declare it. <laughs> right. Machining of any material, regardless of conductivity, Precision, precision machining of brittle, hard materials does not produce electric, thermal, or chemical defects at the surface, can drill circular or non-circular holes in very hard materials, and less stress because of its non-thermal nature. And now someone who is a negative guy, or a negative girl, Sapna. <laughs> <laughs> Loud. You know what? Look at the stool wears fast. Doesn't that contradict? Exactly. So it's that for your homework. I'm giving you. That's why I'm giving you this as a homework. It couldn't be that simple, right? Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, you guys are really paying attention. You got that from the first go. That's that's good. That's a good sign. I want to know too. It's probably everything is relative. What do you mean, fast? Right? Must be something like that. And now for something completely different. Who knows where that line comes from? And now for something completely different. It's a television show, but you're all way too young to remember that. Yeah, who's that old guy? <laughs> no, you're too young. <laughs> it always starts that way, right? And now for something completely different. And so it's indeed very different. I need to tell you about sputtering and focused iron beam milling. And to do, do that, I'm going to lift up the screen and work on the board for a while. Because I need to explain to you guys what a plasma is. Because now we're going to use a plasma to machine things. And how can I machine with a plasma if I don't know what a plasma is? So we're going to create a plasma and we're going to do it together. We're going to figure out how do you create a plasma in your kitchen sink. First of all, while I'm doing this, what is a plasma? I see people Googling, Googling, Googling. What are the four states of material? There's four states of material. Any material? Gas, Gas liquid, solid, plasma. plasma. It's the fourth state of material, maybe the most prevalent state of material. It's out there in space. There we go. That's why, huh? So now the light switch. Oop, I'm sorry. That's the wrong way. I'm trying to find the 
light for the uh, does anyone know the switch for the, the light on the screen? Nothing is happening. No, it's just dimming it again. Sorry, guys. Ah, there we go. I think it's getting better. Are there light switches somewhere in the back? Where? Uh huh. Ah, it looks something. Ah, that's something else yet. Oh, thank you. Engineer. Okay, plasma. Oh, and now I need to have pens. Does that work for the filming? Okay. I hope someone has a pen, otherwise I have to stop the class now, or I have to start again with... Ah. Anyone has a pen? Ah, great. Yeah, throw, throw them at me. Oop. <laughs> Okay, plasma. Can you see this? Is this uh, clear? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to have two electrodes. This is metal, metal plate. This is also metal. And I'm going to put a, a big negative voltage on this side and a positive voltage on this side. And I'm gonna put this in a quartz envelope, in a quartz tube. And now I'm gonna pump vacuum on this tube. Are you with me so far? And I'm gonna make this a distance of 15 centimeters. And now, I'm going to put in a little bit of argon, argon gas. If you don't see it and you don't follow anymore, you have to tell me. Because we're going to get into some little bit of physics. So far, so can you see that also from the back also, yeah? I'm also going to do something else. I'm going to play God. I'm going to put an electron in there. I'm not saying where that electron comes from yet. You know where the argon comes from. I have a tank and I let argon gas in here. But I'm also putting one electron in there. So when I apply and look at the number, 1.5 kilovolts. 1,500 volts. What is the electrical field? Answer that question for yourself. I know all the graduates should know that immediately, but about the undergraduates. So what is the electrical field? I have 15 centimeters, I have 1,500 volts. Give me a number. You remember E is what? Electrical field is voltage over distance. Distance is 15 centimeters. So give me the answer. What's the field? How much is it? It's 100 volts per centimeter, right? Are you all in agreement with that? 100 volts per centimeter. Good. Now suppose that I have that 1,500 volt on here and I measure the resistance of this thing. What would you read, you think? Will this be a low resistance or a high resistance? Again, I would like to hear more from the undergraduates here for a while. For the graduates, it should all be simple. What resistance would I measure? So remember, I just have this inert argon gas, a little bit in it, very low pressure. 
and I have this big voltage, what will happen? Hmm? Is high volt, uh, high resistance or low? What do you think? High or low? High. Very good. It's very high, right? Because there's no current going through here. Nothing can happen. It's like a capacitor so far. Hmm? But now I said I'm God and I'm bringing an electron out of the wherever. I put an electron. Where will this electron go to? Good. So that electron, I'll draw it here. That electron wants to go what direction? This way, right? Now, every time that the electron runs over one centimeter distance, how much energy in electron volt does it get? You can give me a precise answer to that. So I have this electron and it runs in this field for over one centimeter. What energy does it get? There's one precise number you can give me, and I made it easy. It's on the board already. It will get 100. Electron. Very good. It gets 100 electron volts. So that electron now has an energy of 100 electron volts. Now I need to tell you something else. So do you understand this so far? Yeah? OK. Argon. will get ionized when an electron hits it with an energy of about, I forgot it's in your notes, I think it's like 13.5 electron volts, something like that. So do these electrons have enough energy to ionize argon? Absolutely. Absolutely, right? So what happens when an electron hits argon, another electron is formed because it kicks off an electron. So what have we seen? We have one electron coming in, and we end up with two electrons. Now that electron that comes out, it only needs to run a little bit to get enough energy to do the same thing, isn't it? Right? Because if that electron, so argon atom gets hit here by one electron, another electron is kicked off. I have made an argon plus now, right? Yeah, there you go. Now I have two electrons that can get, again, easily 100 electron volts. They can hit argon again. And you know what you get? You get an avalanche. You get a breakdown. At that very moment, you will see that tube starting to glow. A nice glow depending on the type of gas. Bluish for argon. Sodium would be yellow. Eh? Every gas that goes in there will have a different typical color. But the key phenomenon to understand that you now get is how is a plasma created. Now we go through the steps one more time. An electron that's moving from what is called the cathode, negative to positive, hits an argon, sorry, an argon atom, and makes it into an ion. I end up with two electrons. These two electrons can hit two argons, I get how many? Four. four, and so forth. So that's an exponential growth of charged species. And what is a plasma now? A plasma is a mixture of neutral species, radicals, ions, and electrons. It's a soup of charged and uncharged species. So we just created a plasma. Hmm? So make sure that you can do this, that you know how a plasma works. Because when you're going to go visit a clean room, a lot of the equipment there will be based on plasmas. We will use plasmas for etching, for deposition, for a wide variety of techniques. Plasmas are used for manufacturing. But here, you saw in a very simple, basic way how a plasma is created. So I like how a laser works. Sorry? So I like how a laser works. So with a photon? You come to that later. It's, it's actually quite different. Uh, laser is quite different. There's no electrons involved there. Yeah. Yeah, There's any, yes. Uh -huh. So what is the first electron? Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So I'm is really curious. There's many different ways uh, how to do it. One is often uh, a heated filament. 
know, there's a small heater element in there, and you basically cook the electrons off at high temperature. Hmm? Uh, there's about th three or four different ways you do it. Uh, actually, no, I'm not going to ask it as a homework question. That's pushing it too far. Because often the process itself, what I'm explaining is, is a DC plasma or an AC plasma? Very important. What do you think? Is this a DC or an AC? DC, huh? because I have applied a DC voltage. But if you use an AC uh, voltage, the electrons are generated in the process itself. Because what happens, you can have an argon plus, where will that go? I didn't talk about that yet. The argon pluses, where will they go? Hmm? To the left or right? To the right. They're going to hit the cathode, right? And actually, in hitting the cathode, they create electrons, or G electrons they are called. And that maintains the process. So you only need to do it once, one electron. It's like sparking it. Once you spark it, it will self-maintain it. Now I actually gave you an important additional piece of, of information. I told you that the argon plus hits the cathode. And you know, it hits it damn good. It hits it hard. And hitting it, etches it. And there is sputtering. So one of the most common processes uh, you'll see in the clean room and in general practice of manufacturing is sputter cleaning. What is sputter cleaning? It's creating ions like argon plus to mechanically, because remember it's a mechanical machining technique, instead of a big tool, my tool is, is an ion, is an argon ion. And that argon ion hits the surface and knocks off atoms. You can imagine that this is going to be a tool that can make very small things, isn't it? Because my tool is so small. It's basically a stream of ions. And the narrower I can make that stream of ions, if I can make a very thin beam, I can literally machine and etch where my ion beam goes. We can do that with lasers too, right? but here we are doing it with ions we create in a plasma. So let me uh, detail that sputtering step a little bit and clear up a little bit. So this we understand, this is this avalanche, right? One electron hits an argon atom, two come out, they re-energize in the field, have enough energy to hit two more argon atoms, four electrons come out and zoop, you'll see the light go on in that evacuated chamber here. And you get a color corresponding to the type of gas you happen to be using. Any questions on this? By the way, when that current started flowing, what happens with the R? Again, I would like an undergraduate to tell me what happens. So you remember in the beginning, I had no current, right? But now I have this plasma, and electrons are going this way, argon cations, positive ions, are going this way. What happens with this R at that moment? It decreases, right? And why does it decrease? I want to identify more clearly who's undergraduate and who's graduate. So maybe for a little while, would you mind? I'm an undergraduate. You don't have to be ashamed to be an undergraduate, right? So, so for any of the undergraduates, what happens with the R and why? Because the, the current increases, the right. P equals IR. So there you go. It's right. Ohm's law, right? Yeah. So the current increases, uh, R goes down. And so we go literally from almost infinite, from an insulator, to something of, you know, maybe 100, sorry, yeah? Uh, yes, yes, your voltage source gives you 1.5 kilovolts, right? And then in the beginning it drops over this big resistance. Then suddenly it's like you burst it open, the resistance goes from almost infinite to something like 100 to 200 ohms, very low. Any other questions on that? This is an important segment of the class. I would like you to be able by yourself just, okay, how is a plasma formed? Eh? Just understand uh, the physics of it. Would you all be ready to do that? C could you repeat the yeah. elements that are in a plasma? You said it was a soup of, right. of cations. Let's do it together. So what is in, in here? Electrons, argons, ions. And it doesn't necessarily have to be argon, right? No, it could be helium, it could be sodium. Eh? It can be anything that you can make a gaseous face of. In this case, we don't see them. There's often also radicals, and actually radicals are often in the highest concentration. 
Uh, okay, a good physics question. Again, for an undergraduate. And identify yourself maybe with your name. What concentration of species will be the highest here? Neutrals, electrons, cations, or radicals? Could you order them? Which one will be in the lowest concentration, you think? Neutrals. Sorry? Neutrals. Would you agree with that? That would be, well, yeah, what would be, let's start with what will be the lowest concentration. It will be that species that is the least stable. What do you think is the least stable in this soup? What will tend to disappear almost immediately? Try it, try it. Be brave. What do you think? What was the question? Sorry? What was the question? Oh. <laughs> so, who, Please, yeah, so, so, what is that? You said there's radicals in Yeah, so suppose you have a soup in a vessel of radicals, ions, neutrals, and electrons. Uh, what about ions versus electrons? There what? No, no, but remember they disappearing, right? The vessel walls. Actually, I'm introducing a very interesting additional concept about the plasma. They disappearing too. They are being generated, but they're also disappearing. And the one that's the least stable will have the lowest concentration. So electrons will be the lowest concentration. Hmm? That was, that's totally different than my understanding. I thought that would be the exact opposite because there's the cascade effect of electrons mm -hmm. producing more electrons right. producing more electrons. I figured that would outrun the... Now, the electron has a very, very short lifetime. Yeah. As soon as it sees a surface, it disappears. Okay. And actually, this will come to the next question. That could be home, a good homework question. It's kind of a philosophical one. Follow this one with me. It could be a very difficult question or an easy one. You write that one down too. So, I have this metal here and these electrons, they want to very quickly dissipate. They want to go sit on the metal. That means, what charge does a plasma typically have, you think? Because the electrons like to escape the most. It's a plus. Plus, yeah. So space, you think, is positively charged? Because a plasma is positively charged if it's bounded. Hmm? And so if you push this argument further, you could say, well, maybe space has a boundary, right? If you could find that space is positively charged, you could say there must be walls somewhere. Think that's the right argument? Good homework? <laughs> I think that's a little deep. <laughs> I think so, right? It's kind of, and you could get into trouble, right? You might find out, oh, damn. <laughs> I'm not agreeing with Einstein, or I'm not agreeing, you know, <laughs> with Stephen Hawkins. So, but, but it's weird though, right? Uh, if you have a plasma, any plasma, and there's a boundary, because electrons like to escape so fast, you always will end up with a slightly positive charge. I'm, I'm, that's, that, that part is true. And so, can I then not in general say, since, you know, the whole universe is one big plasma, uh, can we go measure this? Maybe it's, you couldn't measure it because your spaceship maybe has all of these walls and it would, you know, interfere with the measurement. You're right, it's becoming too complicated, too philosophical, huh? Yeah, because... <laughs> you mean stop it, like huh? zero somewhere, right? That's the, right. Well, how we get voltage. Right. Zero somewhere. And that would be right. that wall. Your reference. Wall that, you're saying. that would be your ground. The universe right. would be the ground. Right. right. So, so, Anyway, he likes it. He, uh, so he <laughs> likes the question. So, can I assign that question to you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I will no. not. I, I, I will not do that to you guys. So. Okay. That was the introduction to uh, plasma sputtering. And now we're going to go into more details on you actually how you use it. What is the time? I still have about 20 minutes, right? Yeah? Good. Oop. Oh, this thing is coming. Sir.
Uh, well, they also, let me just check. No, the answer is no, you, you will reach an equilibrium at one point uh, where there's an equilibrium between ionized and neutrals. Okay? But there's a quasi equilibrium between the number of electrons, cations, and argon neutrals that establishes, depending on their disappearance rate. The generation rate minus you know, uh, disappearance rate will establish the exact concentration of each species. Are you continuously generating the, the, those, like, that original free electron from that filament? You're continuously heating Not from that. That, that, uh, that you missed there. Eh? So that's an important point. You only need to create it once. Because what then happens when that argon positive hits the cathode, it will knock off electrons. Oh, okay. So the argon right. hitting the cathode generates exactly. new electrons. But it's that first electron okay. that you need to create. Very good. So now, there's uh, two more important slides before we finish this class. So talking about sputtering, we usually mean the usage of the phenomena which are going on at the surface of solids, so the target. Uh, we're going to have a workpiece, we call it the target, that we're going to bombard with, for example, argon plus ions. And I told you how we create these argon plus ions. And in sputtering, you already know, your workpiece will always be on the anode or cathode. On the negative side or positive side? Let's see if you guys followed. Negative, huh? Because the argon plus, the field drives them to the cathode, to the negative. So exposed in a vacuum under the directed flow of atomic particles, ions or neutrals. Ions are extracted from gas discharge plasma uh, as a spatially restricted beam. I didn't tell you much about that yet. Uh, we will sometimes sputter the whole workpiece at once, but much more many more times, we want to create a very narrow plasma beam so that we can etch locally, that we don't etch the whole surface. So creating narrow beams out of these ions is done with electrostatic lenses to make a very narrow etching beam, as we will see in focused ion beam milling. And so uh, ions are extracted from gas discharge plasma as a spatially restricted beam and accelerated by the electric field to the required energies. What was the required energy in the case of uh, the example, argon? 13.5 .5 or so. Eh? Once I have that, I can ionize the argon. Now, usually for the purpose, that second bullet point is very important because it connects to a figure on the next slide. Look at these numbers. Usually, for the purposes of sputtering, we use energies from about 100 electron volt to 5,000 electron volt. See the figure on the next slide. So what happens? With ions of that energy, uh, between uh, that's 0.1 kilovolt, right, to 0.25 kilo electron volt, basically this is happening. So these ions knock atoms in the surface, and if they hit it from the right direction, they knock the atoms out. It's like billiard. Just think about it like playing billiard. That is sputtering. And you can see why it's called a mechanical machining technique, eh? because it's really momentum transfer of your incoming ions knocking off atoms from the surface. And so you see that energy range. Now let's look at a curve. That's re really very important. Here is the ion energy in electron volt. Let's say uh, 1, 10 electron volt, 100,000. And what we show here on the left is the sputtering yield. That means how much atoms do you knock off the surface per incoming ion? So if you want to sputter very well, very fast, you want that number to be high. Right? And so what you will see is this. Look at that little table. I want you to know that table because it will serve you very well in your career. Uh, because it gives you some very good physics understanding of the interaction of ions with any surface depending on the energy. Look. If I have an energy of an ion hitting the surface with less than 3 electron volt, all that happens is it might stick there, but that's it. Huh? So it might just physically absorb, and voila, nothing else happens. Now you go a little bit higher, 4 to 10 electron volt, that's the second entry. You will have a little bit of surface sputtering, but not much. Maybe you'll be cleaning off some absorbed organics, some carbons. You're cleaning up the surface. Well, not much more than that. But look what happens, that magic from 10 to 5,000, 
that's where you're here, you're having this very fast growth because now the energy is sufficient to knock off ions from the surface. Right? Now I'm going to ask you guys if you understand what happens at that peak there. Why do you think there's a peak there? Very good, very good answer. So, that he's right. The reason why this peaks is you're now starting to embed ions in a solid. Why is that useful? Why would you want to do that? So, because this curve is actually showing three kind of manufacturing techniques. Huh? Cleaning, sputtering, and ion implantation. Huh? Hardening the surface, but you know where you use it the most. Where do you use it the most? Oh, maybe semiconductors. Very, very good. Semiconductors. How do you think you dope silicon? If you want to make silicon N or P type, you know what they do? They have an iron, they accelerate at voltages corresponding to that peak, and instead of knocking off atoms, they embed themselves into the solid. And yeah, you change their conductivity or you harden the material, etc. You see why that little table is so important? It basically tells you of these four lines, each of those is a manufacturing process. The first one is not really a manufacturing process, right? It's just absorption. But then the second one is really, could be cleaning. It could be cleaning off dirt of a surface. Third one is literally etching. And the fourth one, is implantation, iron implantation. So you've seen that one and the same technique can go from sputtering to, so from subtractive to additive. Eh? So very interesting. I lost my phone. Can I get my phone back? <laughs> yes, sir. So you do know that this is one of the things that happens in this class. You might suddenly appear on the internet. <laughs> What? Is that good? No? <laughs> okay. You approve? <laughs> yeah? Okay. <laughs> if I fall asleep, you can do it too. <laughs> what do you think is on the right here, that picture? What would that be? Plasma. Plasma, yeah. That's what you're talking about. By the way, one thing that you should not confuse this with is blood plasma. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is not blood plasma? The same thing. Yeah, it's not the same thing, right? Who knows what blood plasma is? It's the white fluid between your blood cells. Sorry? Clear. Yeah? Blood plasma, yeah, what is that? It's what they pay more for than blood. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, please don't confuse the two, right? So maybe that could be a trick question, because I'm going to do multiple choice midterms and finals. So uh, don't confuse blood plasma with this plasma. So sputtering, a little bit more, and actually this is uh, repeating. You should be very comfortable with everything I said here. Oh, and I see one error. Do you see the error? So it's 15.7 electron volt for that ionization. Anyway, so the simplest plasma reactor that we described on the board there consists of opposed parallel plate electrodes in a chamber maintainable at low pressure, typically in the order of one millibar. The electrical potential established in the reaction chamber, filled with an inert gas such as argon at a reduced pressure, determines the energy of ions and electrons striking the surface immersed in the discharge. Now, this bullet point here is the drawing I had on the board. Right? So we had two electrodes, 15 centimeters apart, 1.5 kilovolts over the two, and then we explained the mechanism on how we create out of that these argon plus ions that do the sputtering, that do all of the work. Any questions on this? No? Question? Yeah. While you're doing this, are you constantly pumping argon into the chamber? No, because an equilibrium gets established, uh, you know, between 
reformation of the argon, because a lot of the argon plus will indeed recapture electrons and become argon again. Yeah? So you don't need to you don't need to flush. Any other question? That's a good question. No? I start expecting questions. <laughs> no? So now we're going a little bit more complicated. What I'm showing here is the voltage distribution of this plant parallel uh, chamber I showed you. Now, this is when I apply an AC voltage. What I did show you first was a DC voltage. Right? Now I tell you that the DC voltage distribution is exactly the same as this one. And let me try to explain. So what I'm showing here is the voltage as a function of distance between the two electrodes, cathode on this side, anode on the other side. For the moment, forget this capacitor on the left. Can you do that in your mind? It's hard though, right? I project it, but I'm asking you to forget it, right? <laughs> Okay. Have you forgotten it? I've forgotten it. Good, okay. And so what I have in there is instead a DC. And how does a DC look like? What? No, no. we're going to go slowly here, huh? because not everyone uh, remembers everything of uh, fundamentals of electricity course. So I have these two metal electrodes, and I apply a DC voltage. That DC voltage, once the plasma is created, distributes itself between these two electrodes. Now follow with me, we're going to set small steps. In the middle of the plasma, that VP, the plasma potential, what sign does that have? And you guys know already why. Positive, right? And why? You know, basically, electrons disappear faster than ions. Huh? And I have mostly these argon pluses created. So basically, I have some argon pluses more than I have electrons because they disappear faster. And where are they? They are in the metal, in the electrodes. Right? Now, why do I have an asymmetry here? Why is there this big, big voltage drop on the cathode and not on the anode? I want to see if someone and the group could come up with this. I'm going to give you some hints. You can someone on the, on the right direction, someone has some inkling why this might happen? We are on the perfect direction. What moves faster, an electron or an ion? Much faster. That means as ions are attracted to the cathode, negative, Electrons will move faster away than ions are coming in. In other words, I create a mass, a charge imbalance that creates a voltage. Eh? So that is why I have in front of the cathode, all the voltage drop is in front of the cathode. And that is why the cathode is where the hitting of the argons has so much effect. Did you follow that? That was good. The reason why there's an imbalance here Ions are very slow, 10,000 times slower than the electrons. That means if I look at any moment in time over the charge distribution, I will find more positive charges here than electrons. Huh? And that means I will have always the biggest voltage drop in front of the cathode. Now, I wonder if you're going to know the next question. Still the same setup, no capacitor, and I apply an AC voltage. Voltage distribution on anode and cathode. That's actually a pretty simple answer. What do you expect? So we have an anode and a cathode, and now instead of negative, positive, this one, what happens with AC? Switches, Switches. negative, positive, negative, positive. This one, negative, positive, negative, positive. What does that mean? The voltage would be? Equal. Huh? So how do I make it unequal? Aha! I put a capacitor there. And what does a capacitor do? Changes AC to filters. You see, the site where the capacitor is, 
we know the electrons will hit that electrode first, they charge it up, and they create a charge imbalance, and voila. So for some fantastical reason, a DC plasma and an AC plasma, in terms of voltage distribution, can look exactly the same. That is, if you put a capacitor in there. Now, why would I want to have an AC sputtering system instead of a DC sputtering? Again, if you could answer that, you're my hero of the day. Why would I do that? Anyone dares to answer that? Yeah. Very good. So now we can erase the picture from the web. That is very good. So he was actually listening. Huh? You have people like that. It's OK. Good man. So he's right. If I want to sputter edge silicon dioxide or aluminum oxide, why can I not use a DC plasma? Not you, someone else. So, you know, then I'm on the cathode, I would put an insulator, right? Why can I not use a DC plasma? Who dares to answer that? Hmm? Say? I wasn't getting the answer. Okay. It's more fundamental. Think about it. DC, can that go to an insulator? Ah. AC can go to an insulator, right? That's the reason. Hmm? As soon as I put uh, an insulator there and I have a DC, what happens? I go in overload. Nothing happens. So you cannot sputter edge ever an insulator in a DC plasma. That's why you need an AC plasma. Okay. So for graduates, there might be a question about this plasma distribution, not for undergraduates. I told you I will now and then in the class make some distinction. Right? But for ambitious undergraduates that want to have an A super plus, they might try to answer too. Right? Yeah. Um, the item that you're sputtering, is that the cathode itself or is it set on top of the cathode? Yeah, you put it on top of the cathode. Eh? So, so let's say you have a silicon wafer and there's a, an aluminum oxide layer you want to remove. You will put that whole silicon wafer on the cathode. Hmm? Uh, we will learn later that in CVD and PVD, you will actually, instead of putting your workpiece on the cathode, you will put it on the anode. So remember that once I start using the same plasma in additive mode, the workpiece will move from the cathode to the anode. But I'll come back to that so you don't have to worry about this at this point. Okay, so I will stop it here and we'll finish this class definitely on Thursday and I might even get started on class five. Yeah.